For the second lecture, I'm going to give you a brief uh, historical understanding to the structure of our current uh, economic system. I'm going to look at four different topics. The first one will be a brief history of economic theories that have uh, contributed to capitalist thought. The second one, I'll highlight some of the ideas of uh, Keynes and uh, their relation to development economics. Thirdly, I will explain a shift from Keynesianism to uh, neoliberalism. And then finally, I'll touch on um, how neoliberalism influenced and uh, affected development economics in a way that we have something that we had something called the uh, Washington Consensus. So first, I'm going to go back to the 15th century. Uh, with mercantilism. So from the 15th century to about the mid-1800s, there was something called mercantilism. This was an economic theory which was based on the state was the center of both the economic and political life. The objective of this uh, theory was that the state was the... the state was able to increase its power and was able to do this by having a positive trade balance. So you wanted to export more goods than you imported. At the end of a certain time period, the country that did not do that, the country that uh, took in more exports than they sent out in imports with a particular country, they would have to pay back that first country through gold or silver. And this was a way for the state to become more powerful, uh, gain economic strength. Now, the ideas um, at this time, the ideas, institution, politics, economics, they all were there to support the manufacturing sector because that's the sector that you would um, export most of your goods from. At the same time, there was something called the Enlightenment going on. And the Enlightenment was um, philosophical thoughts, uh, how to act and be individuals, but also act in the common good. So, the idea of this, in the Enlightenment thought, was that uh, institutions could provide the framework, and then within that framework, individuals could act freely. So, you had the idea then that individuals could be free, doing acting how they saw fit, but at the same time, the institutions were organized, in a way that they would still work for the common good, that people would still work for the common good. So, most of the times when you think of uh, capitalist thought, the first person you'll think of will be Adam Smith. But actually, 75 years before Adam Smith, there was a man named Henry Martin, and he wrote a book called um, Considerations Upon the East India Trade. In that book, he argued that a country was not rich based on the amount of gold or silver they had. And his example in that book is Spain. So Spain had gold and silver, but it wasn't particularly rich, and it wasn't particularly rich because the people could not consume uh, products. The average person didn't have enough money to consume products, so how rich could a country be even though it had a lot of gold and silver? So then his example was that Holland was a, was a richer country because it was able to consume more goods. And this is, uh, I'll give you two quotes from his book. And the first one is that the kingdom, and he's re referring to England right now, that the kingdom is not more impoverished by the consumption of Indian than of English manufacturers. So this is a particularly interesting idea at the time, in that he was arguing, even if we were to consume manufactured goods from a different country, that wouldn't make England poorer. This is a new, quite radical thought at the time. The argument was that specialization, that countries could specialize in a certain field in manufacturing. And then through that specialization, they could trade with each other. So I'll give you another bit of a longer quote. The East India trade is in no unlikely way to introduce more artists, more order and regularity into our English manufacturers. It must put an end to such of them as are useless and unprofitable. The people employed in these will betake themselves to others, the most plain and easy, or to the single parts of other manufacturers of more variety. So you can see his argument now was that if you were to lose out due to this lack of specialization, or India had a better specialization in a particular field, then you would be able to join another manufacturing sector 
or start something new, which would then contribute to the growth and development of England. So this is a particularly radical idea at the time. You can see it's uh, beginning to shift away from mercantilism. Um, trade is becoming more and more important, trade between different countries. And this idea of specialization, becoming an expert in a particular trade or manufacturing or in a group of them, and then being able to do that with other countries. Now the next person to sort of carry on that thought is Adam Smith, the one that you would probably have heard of before. And he wrote The, the Wealth of Nations. And um, his argument was that the mercantilism, the economic structure and use at that time, uh, favored the producers and not the home consumers. So the home consumers, individuals, private people, they were paying more for a product than what was necessary. And they were paying more so that the producers could hold on to greater wealth. So his argument was that if there were free trade organized by the market and not by the state, like in mercantilism, that the consumer would not be burdened with the whole experience of maintaining and defending the empire. So the costs of maintaining and defending the empire were falling on the home consumer. And uh, Smith was arguing that we shouldn't be doing this because this is an irrational use of our resources. The home consumer should be able to benefit from free trade. And then we have to change how we uh, organize our economic structure. Uh, his second main argument was that humans were self-interested and self-interested in that they desired to trade. So his famous quote, which you've probably heard before, it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, brewer, or baker that we expect our dinner, but from regard to their own interest. So Adam Smith was a strong believer in that each individual acted out of their own self-interest, and through their acting in their own self-interest, but in the forces of the market, and the market forces, something that he called the invisible hand, then we were able to, or people were able to consume goods in a way that was both good for the common good of everybody, but as well for the individual, and they could act out of their own self-interest. So the market was there to sort of control, uh, regulate how people interacted with each other, but people were able to interact with each other out of their own free will, making their own economic decisions. Uh, one more person at the time who was quite important was John Stuart Mill. And he wrote The Principles of Political Economy. And he even pushes this idea of the individual acting liberally, freely. He pushes that even more. So his quote is, We have observed that, as a general rule, the business of life is better performed when those who have an immediate interest in it are left to take their own course, uncontrolled either by the mandate of the law or by the meddling of any public functionary. So you can see this continual push here that... Um, Individuals need to be at the center, the economic structure, and then the state and institutions only provide that framework. But the individuals are able to act freely out of their own accord, doing the actions, doing the business that they see fit, best fit for them. The final person <clears throat> who was quite important at this time was David Ricardo. And um, he took that same idea of trade specialization that um, Henry Martin started with and gave it a particular name. So he started to call this comparative advantage. So the idea was that each state has uh, a manufacturing or a good, agricultural good, that they're particularly good at. And then that's the good that they should put all of their resources in. So they should specialize. If you're Spain, you should specialize in wine. If you're England, you should specialize in some sort of manufacturing. And by doing that and then trading with each other, both Spain and England would benefit, and he called that comparative advantage. So those four males, they um, contributed greatly to the way that we understand the economy today and how economics works and capitalism works. We're going to look, their ideas will come up over and over again over this lecture series and, and also more today. But just to summarize um, the economic philosophy that came from this time, people are self-interested, rational, competitive, um, the individual should be free, but exist within a set of institutions. The best way to regulate the market, uh, to regulate the economy is the market and not the state. 
and free trade and comparative advantage uh, finds the best price for the home consumer as well. So the cheapest price will be fine through those, those means. At the same time, there's the Industrial Revolution, which is happening in England. The um, steam engine was invented the same year that uh, Adam Smith wrote Wealth of, Nations, Wealth of Nations, for example. So from the Industrial Revolution, there are also sort of five social and technical innovations that, that influenced the time. The first one, that agriculture started to rise. So there started to be more and more food, and that came from sort of manufacturing or technological improvements. Because less people needed to work on the farm, they could move to the city centers, so there was a greater degree of urbanization. There was also more trade links between countries. Uh, property rights became uh, more formalized and more legal, so people knew what kind of property they had, and if you had property, then you could then do something with your property. You could get a loan because you had a piece of property, or you could invest into something. So there was something more to invest into. And there was also just like a general scientific revolution going on. So you're, you're seeing more and more developments, technological developments happening quicker and quicker. So we'll sort of skip over a bit of time and we'll move up to Keynes now. So we've had this sort of capitalist economic idea happening. And now we're at Keynes. And Keynes kind of believed that there needed to be a degree of state intervention. Um, economies couldn't regulate themselves on their own. So the market wasn't a sufficient force to regulate the economy. What you needed was state intervention in a particular uh, manner, two, two ways. So the first one that he stated was adjusting the interest rate. So the central bank can adjust the interest rate. They can either lower it or raise it. And if you were going to lower the uh, interest rate there, you're encouraging businesses, you're encouraging investments, because it's cheaper for businesses to get money from the bank with a lower interest rate. So they would take more money from the bank and then invest that money into their businesses. The next thing you could do is you could raise the interest rates. And by raising the interest rates, then you're doing the opposite. You're slowing down the economy. So if an economy is overheated, if it's moving too quickly, then you can raise interest rates to slow it down. And um, this is quite a popular idea um, for a few decades. But when it came to the 1960s, 1970s, there just begins to be a, a bit of a crisis in Keynesian economics. And um, this had to do with inflation costs that were a result of um, the oil crisis. So we have this oil crisis. Oil becomes more expensive, so making products becomes more expensive. Productivity decreases and the economy slows down and by it slowing down you couldn't just cut interest rates to sort of get that economy to start moving again. So this is a particularly difficult idea for Keynesian economics to deal with and um, at the same time there are two economists, uh, Frederick Van Hyck and Milton Friedman, who are sort of arguing against Keynesian economics and pushing a more neoliberal free market approach. So Von Hayek, now, he starts pushing his ideas of neoliberalism to particular political leaders at that time. And what he wanted to do the most is he wanted to get the pri best prices or get the prices right, it's called. So how you did that was he believed that prices came from a collection of um, individual choices. So me buying a bottle of water doesn't set the price, but lots and lots of people, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people buying a bottle of water, now that would then set the price for that bottle of water. So through numerous, countless transactions, a price could be found. And that price was then the launching point how an economy would grow. Once the right price was found for a product, then the economy would stabilize, after stabilizing, it could grow and develop forward. So what he really believed in was finding that right price and going from there. And that's an important idea that will come up more than once. So the second idea was that the price came from all these individual choices, how much you choose to spend on that bottle of water. What that also means is that any planning involved in the economy was a failure by definition. If there was any state planning, if there was any state um, regulations on price controls, 
that would be a failure to the economy and the economy wouldn't function the way it should be functioning. So the state, all regulatory measures have to be taken out of the process and individuals need to decide on the price based on these uh, interaction transactions between each other. And that sort of takes us to really the first idea of development economics. The first idea of development economics is that you always want to get the prices right. This is the belief, this is the belief of development economists today still. If the prices were right, then the economy would stabilize and then you could move forward and experience economic development. Now, this did not always happen. Prices have been quote unquote right, but that doesn't mean that the economy has stabilized and it doesn't mean that uh, a country or a city or a locality has experienced economic growth, able to move forward. So the next idea that um, came about was that, well, if we can't, if we get the prices right and the economy is still not developing, maybe it's institutions. So maybe the institutions aren't correct and the institutions need to change. And this led to an idea called the Washington Consensus. The Washington Consensus has uh, 10 principles behind it, and I'll briefly explain each of them. The first one is fiscal discipline. So a country should experience or have fiscal dis discipline. By doing this, they should match your public expenditure to the resources available. So you shouldn't spend more than what your country has. The second idea of the Washington Consensus is uh, you should be reducing public expenditure. And first you would do that in defense and public administration and subsidies. Those are the first areas where you, you would want to reduce that public expenditure and uh, not overspend, spend more than what you have. The next thing you'd want to do is you, want, you would want to reform your tax system. So you'd want to broaden your tax base. So you, you want to get more people paying taxes, but you would want to cut the tax rate and you would want to improve the administration of tax reform. So you have more people paying taxes, but you're able to collect them in a better way because you can do those two things and you can lower the tax rate and more people have money to spend in the economy. Interest rates, you would want your interest rates to be determined by the market and generally you'd want them to be positive as well. So you don't want the state to intervene when it comes to setting of interest rates. You notice that's almost in opposition to Keynesianism where you would argue that the state should be involved in setting the interest rate. Uh, you would also want to have a competitive exchange rate, and by competitive exchange rate, that usually meant a lower exchange rate. By having a lower exchange rate of your currency, you would be able to export more of your goods and experience growth through the export market. Uh, to experience growth through the export market, you also need the next one, which is trade liberalization. So you'd want to remove restrictions on imports as well as um, improve your export sector as much as possible. You would want to encourage direct foreign direct investment. Uh, you'd be able to get capital into your, your country uh, quicker, more efficiently, and then that capital could invest in, in manufacturing or in the export market so that your country could grow. It's under the assumption that the capital doesn't already exist in that country, or at least if it does exist, it's not being invested in manufacturing. Uh, you'd also want to privatize. Uh, privatization is an important idea in development economics. The idea is that it would be more efficient if you were to privatize and you'd find that finding the best price would be easier through privatization than if it's a state, um, state set price. You would also want to deregulate. Um, so here you're, you're, you're deregulating different uh, tasks that the government would do and you're doing that so that they can continue doing those tasks, but they would be influenced by market forces when doing them. So this deregulation idea is that you could do other administration, and the administration could do these different tasks, but they would be in competition with each other, for example, and that um, you would have market forces entering into this, uh, this idea. And finally, you would want to have property rights, even stronger property rights, so that people know what they have and then they can use that as collateral to get loans or whatnot from banks. So how there were Washington Consensus ideas were often implemented was that it reduced state intervention uh, and allowed individuals to be free, acting of their own accord. 
and it encouraged the invisible hand from Adam Smith, encouraged that invisible hand to be able to sort of regulate the market in some way. Now, these policies, they, the Washington consensus in particular, hasn't really succeeded. Um, it's critiqued. You wouldn't find it anymore in development work. But why it failed, there are different reasons why. The first one would be um, maybe there were just bad policies that were there to get the elite of countries richer. Uh, another reason would be that policies were not implemented correctly. So the ideas were there, but the countries didn't implement those policies correctly. Or another idea is that the policies were there, but they were not implemented enough. So what you need is more liberalization, not less of it. And uh, another way to look at it, and something I'll talk about later as well, is that the, maybe the policies were trying to solve the wrong problem. We have this idea in the developing world that they're experiencing no growth. There's a chronic failure. And we'll look at this a little bit later, but if you go through the data, you'll kind of see that um, it's not a fact of no growth. It's not chronic failure. There are other reasons at play. It's, it's more of a fluctuation of growth, not no growth. So maybe these were just the wrong policies uh, at the wrong time. And the last sort of things to remember when it comes to this uh, development of capitalism to, up until the Washington Consensus is that all of this was happening within the Cold War. So it was very difficult for you for an individual to be able to critique neoliberalism without being against your country, without being a, someone who wants to see communism or socialism. So there was not a great deal of uh, debate in the public sphere, because if you were to debate these ideas, then you would be viewed as a socialist, and that's, that's not how you could be viewed at that particular time, or your ideas would then, would then not enter into the political spectrum, let's say. The other thing that it made easier is that it's easier to get support from groups that are marginalized through neoliberalism. In the economy, there are always people who are winners and there are people who are losers. But because this is happening within the Cold War, the people who are losers, quote unquote losers in the economy, they can still sort of be told, well, you're supporting our country, you're being a patriot by doing and following these principles. And if you're not, then you're not being a patriot. So these sort of um, social aspects could help to keep this uh, economic theory in place and not have it be critiqued uh, the way it would be if it were not existing in the Cold War. So in the following lectures, we'll build on these ideas that uh, I first discussed in this one.